Hey everybody, welcome back to the show. We've got a long ways to go in this episode. I'd like to get the rest of the components on top of the starting engine and have basically the whole build up done on this thing. So first though, we do have to pay a little bit of homage to the Eisman Magneto. That's right. If I had to be a Magneto, I'd be an Eisman. Not even kidding you. So <laughs> that's a um, couple comments under the last episode saying how big, just how bulky this Magneto is compared to like modern race car or aviation equivalents. That is a big Eisman Magneto. Yes, this is a CM4 I picked up. It's a core, it's a rebuilder. I got it last fall and oh, I love the old Eisman logo with the lightning bolts coming out around the Eisman name. And this is a Caterpillar mag found on the gasoline powered cats of the same vintage as 1113. It's got the Caterpillar impulse on it yet. And I love them. I just look at the big Eisman tag that they rivet to the side. And look at this, this little side panel, it's got louvers and like three sets of them. Who, <laughs> who, who does that? It's like, how do you justify that? But just the craftsmanship, the design of these is just, it, it's almost beyond belief. Another one of their triple louvered panels back there. Tag on this side's pretty bad. I think it spent some time sitting on the ground, but just, I love it. And the cap's pretty rough. This is a sure sign of butchery right here. Someone actually like um, etched the plug wire numbers in here. Oh, how do you even do that? But it needs a new cap anyhow, but that's beside the point. Just, yeah, there's a style and a class of, of the Eismans that is just unmatched in my book. This is my personal favorite manufacturer of Magnetos right here, the Eisman. Um, right down to the oil cup, look at this. So you've got like a cork seal on the backside held on by a brass rivet. And when you open the cap, the tail end is actually kicked up so that it doesn't like hit the housing and you can get it open up far enough to get the oil. I just, I love it. I love every aspect of these magnetos. Um, yeah. And another fun comparison. Yeah, it's fully half the size of the starting engine by itself. When you get one of these magnetos completely restored, they are really beautiful. They're very aesthetically pleasing, at least in my book. So yeah, like I said, Iceman mags, hands down, my favorite mags of all time. Squatch approved. So let's get the Magneto put on. Once again, we're gonna align the M mark on the mag gear with the M mark on the cam gear. Got the window off the front because we're gonna do one last timing check of the rotor in there, or the cam I should say, and this cork ring seal goes on the front. Just like that. I can see both of the M marks lined up in there. Now I'll roll it from the top center mark to the mag mark so it's in line with the scribe on the cover and we'll look in through the window here and yes that white timing mark on the gear is in line with the pointer arrow in the center of the top of that opening so we're good for timing I can put the plug in put the cover back on just finishing up hanging the spark plug wires now and they go through these guide tubes on each side of the mag and down along the water jacket on each side, routes them cleanly, keeps them protected from the belt and the control rods and everything else. And speaking of control rods, they're up next. These little friction pucks are what hold the rods in position. Just finished threading both of the knobs on. You can see this one says choke, that one says throttle. They thread on and then they're locked in position with that small jam nut. Another interesting little side note, the throttle knob had been missing, but then I remembered I had pulled one out of the bottom of that bell housing when I first started fighting that rusty stuck clutch. I'll pop you to the link right there if you wanna go back and relive that. 
cleaned it up and you know what it said throttle and the threads were good and it fit right in place so we just put that back where it belongs right so check the operation of the controls choke linkage is working fine and throttle for low speed operation you pull the throttle rod out and this tang is going to come up against that pin on the throttle plate and just forces it closed that's your low speed operation so you push it in for high speed you can see the tang moves off of the pin and high speed operation is solely dictated by the adjustment of that governor spring we briefly got into that when we were doing the governor so that's how the throttle linkage works in an indirect manner it's not even attached to the throttle plate another question was every time you have to move this governor out to tighten the belt again what happens to your linkage it's threaded right there with a jam nut so you just adjust the length or you change the length of this linkage to match the new position of the governor every time you tighten the belt i've got the wire in place from the mag to the switch this is also the original eisman switch really happy about that and i didn't even have to take it apart or do anything to it it works perfectly so it's just a contact switch when it's in the off position it allows this lug to be grounded to the case the case makes contact with the bracket and the bracket makes contact with the chassis grounding the mag cutting the spark and when you're in the on position it just breaks contact from that lug to the body and the magneto can spark away yes it sure gets busy on top of these starting engines when you get all of those components in place so the next thing we're going to have to do is fuel system to feed the carburetor so probably the most efficient means of doing that instead of rigging up at like an accessory tank is to get the dash panel and the cowl panel assembled to the back of the diesel engine if i do that then i also have a means for throttle control for the diesel because in order to attain the shutoff position that linkage has to be held forward against spring pressure so it's going to be less work just mocking that dash up to the back of the engine than it would be to put all these other rube goldberg controls in place so that's what we're going to do up at the top here now the inlet elbow on top of the carburetor actually attaches to the dash panel there's a hole that feeds through it so we need a gasket on this side another gasket goes in place on the outside of the dash and the air cleaner for the starting engine it's a oil bath type pretty much just like the air cleaner for the diesel and to make this fit up possible i had to create these brackets for each side of the engine stand because well the side fenders bolt to the bell housing using these four bolts here and then of course they stick up about that high and the three bolts of the dash panel go into each side of the fender so because we don't have fenders in place i was able to replicate the bolt pattern and put a mounting bracket on each side of the stand so we're complete up to that point next thing we have to do is a little bit of work on the top cowl because here's the throttle lever for the diesel engine and we have some issues with it it's pretty loose because the button here on the top is supposed to have some decent spring tension on it because that's how it engages with that notched quadrant down below that's pretty mushy so i'm betting that spring has given up it's probably broken and then we have the detent plunger for the shutoff and that's got way too much free float that should be under spring tension in at all times and that's as far out as i can pull it so it's not going to drop into the hole for the end of that peg so you're not gonna be able to get it to fall shut off either so we're gonna have to remedy both of those issues So getting to the first spring is pretty easy. At this point, we can just pull that plunger out 
and yes, sure enough, pretty much nothing left of that old spring at all. So it's in pieces. The second one is going to be a little bit more of a challenge because it's captured by the knob on the end of the, the little plunger rod. So what we have is, you can see a pin, cross pin goes through. It's heavily peened over on that side. It's not peened over quite as far here. So I'll carefully take a file and I'll file that down flat just before I get into uh, the knob. And that'll give me a better idea where exactly to place the punch to drive that pin out. So the pin is out and I need to pull the knob from the plunger rod. They're not that tight of a fit, but then they get rusty too and I don't wanna take a hammer and have to beat it up. So I built a puller tool. We have the first piece, it's this plate with the notch in it. The notch is gonna surround the plunger rod and act kind of as a backstop. I have these two slightly countersunk holes in it. The other half of the tool is this um, slightly heavier plate with a Bigger notch, that's going to go right behind the knurled portion of the knob and it's got two pusher bolts in it. You can see I've machined the threads off at the tips of each one. That's so each bolt can center in a countersunk hole. And when you run these bolts in, it keeps the two plates from walking around independent from one another. Go together just like that and just start tightening the bolts. Just like that, there's the knob. Let's see what's left of that spring, yeah. <laughs> that doesn't even look like a spring anymore. Wow, pretty bad. Well, after cleaning everything up, yeah, not much left of those old springs, especially that small one. Not good. But good part is I do have two replacements. So both of those look much, much better. We'll start with the shut off plunger. And when going back together, I cover these things with a light coating of grease. It's gonna help them last a lot longer. And with everything cleaned up, the knob goes back on a lot easier now too. New pin. There. That's good. Peen the pin over on both sides. That's what it's supposed to be. No more of that free float in it. Now for the easy plunger and spring, right? That can just drop in. Time to test it out. Yeah, that's a lot better than it was before. Nice positive push to that plunger. Let's test the shut off. So pull that out, go ahead, drops into the hole. Nice, keeps it in the shut off position. Pull the plunger back out, depress the other one. Yep. That's exactly how it's supposed to work. Now that we're finished with the handle, we can bolt the starting engine's gas tank to the back side of the cowl.
Now let's get the cowl onto the dash panel. I'm just going to hang it with these two regular bolts for now because it's held on by two of these slotted head machine screws. One there and one there. With the cowl bolts tight, next up is the throttle control rod. It passes through that hole right there. Extends alongside the breather on top of the top cover. Cutter pins in place, let's test it out. We have throttle. And that leaves us with just the sediment bowl and the fuel line for the starting engine. We have the right, correct, and proper Zenith sediment bowl to match that Zenith carburetor on 1113. You can see the breakdown in the early 5J manual. Numbers shown in italics are Zenith part numbers, stated right at the bottom right there. So the later ones were all made by Bendix. I think you see Bendix on there. All to the same spec so it really there's really no difference between them but we're mostly complete here with the exception of that 9b 4517 element that is up inside the bowl up in there it threads into the top part right in the center right there that is what cat also refers to as an edge filter so it's a secondary fuel filter so the fuel is going to come in the top and it's actually going to hit the bowl first the larger particles will settle out in the bowl and then as the fuel level rises it goes through those edge filters and then out of the outlet onto the carburetor and i can show you what one of those looks like it's going to take me a couple minutes to get to it though so i had to shovel my trailer deck off anyhow so it was a good excuse to get that done and we can just skip right on over to the ground again yeah shoveled all this just for the shot but squatch rules for life number one don't be afraid of work rule number two make work afraid of you so here's the rd6 and hopefully we can get some light Right up in here, it's like a silver stack of discs. I think you can see it. it. Only extends down about where that line is in the glass. That's what we're talking about. And back to the shop once again. So those stacks of edge filter discs were made so that there was actually small, tiny little slots between them. So the fuel could actually go and seat between the discs through those slots and then the centers were perforated, allowing it to go up the center of the stack and on out of the sediment bowl. And it was, like I said, a secondary means of filtration. They're getting really hard to find now because sediment bowls collect moisture and over the years that moisture would corrode those stacks of discs and being so fragile to begin with, they would pretty much crumble and there's nothing left of them anymore. But I do have a workaround for that. It has to do with this modern inline fuel filter, but I need to get the paper element out of it. So here we are, the top end was already open. I drill a hole in the bottom end of it to fit a 4x40 machine head screw, stainless steel, inch and 5 eighths long. And then I cut a small little cork gasket to go on the top of the filter. Attach it to the base with the screw. Make sure that cork gasket is up to seal the top. And we have a perfect stand-in for that original edge filter stack. Is it as cool as an edge filter stack? Probably not but it's going to function just the same. Sediment bowl with gasket go in place. Tighten the bale. We're ready to thread the sediment bowl assembly into the bottom of that tank along with the fuel line fitting for the carburetor. Let's get it done. Eh, it does kind of look nice.
And there it is. We've got the tap, shutoff tap facing the same side as the starting engine controls, so that makes it convenient to access. Fuel lines in place. I always put the spiral in there to absorb vibration. Passes through the dash just fine. Clears everything on the other side, makes its way over to the carburetor. And that means we're out of parts. We're out of pieces that we need to put onto this before we can see if it's going to run. Aside from, I always put test gauges on the fuel pressure port and the oil pressure port over there so I get exact readings as to what the outputs are and all that stuff. So we don't bother with needle gauges to begin with. Um, and, well, the best way I can nutshell it, starting these for the first time after a complete rebuild like this is never a smooth easy process because there's so many things that need readjusting you know there's going to be carburetor adjustments for sure there's going to be governor spring adjustments for sure almost always pinion latch adjustments i mean we've just kind of set these where we know they're close but you know to to, to really dial them in it's uh there's usually some false starts and may even need to go way back into the crankcase to turn on that thumb wheel that sets the oil pump output pressure for the diesel engine the fuel transfer pump output pressure is still on my mind because this is that first generation setup that has that rather weak looking spring and pop it in my book, at least compared to the later builds. So we're going to be monitoring that very closely. I have some concerns whether or not all four of the pre-coms are going to seal into the cylinder head and not let water into cylinders. We're going to be monitoring that. We're going to be watching water pump packing nut. That's usually something that always needs attention. Some babysitting after you get fluid in these things and start turning stuff over. And um, we got I got some sleepless nights ahead of me. This is the part that I just never, I'm never really in, into it because it doesn't matter how careful I've ever been with one of these, I have yet to hit a home run. I've never done a complete rebuild on a Caterpillar power unit like this and not had something that I had to go back in and redo. So maybe this will be the first one. I don't know, but... Well, that's where we are. So, once again, everybody, thanks for watching. Um, yeah, not really looking forward to the next step, but we're going to start dumping fluids in it and um, assess. Just keep an eye on things for a little bit, kind of creep up to it, and then um, wrap rope on that starting engine flywheel and see if we can make some noise. So, that's where we sit right now. Thanks for watching, everybody. I hope you'll be back. I bet you will. <laughs>